was like, uh. So my back is terrible because that's what happens when you are old and um, you move furniture. <laughs> it's like, you know what? If you're not going to use us, we're just, we're going to leave. <laughs> Okay, I'm like, ladies, I'm trying. I want to. <laughs> yeah. I thought we were supposed to be like better off as we level up, but apparently that, <laughs> there's a crescendo on that one. Yeah. yeah. Apparently. We, we get better in the mind. Uh, we just get worse in the body. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll agree to that. It's so unfair. If it's only there so... were some way that we could stave oh, off death. <laughs> Perfect segue. Perfect segue. <laughs> Welcome to Certain Point of View's Another Past Podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Just go to CertainPOV.com. Hey everyone, and welcome to Another Past Podcast. I'm Case Aiken, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, Sam Alisea. Hello! Uh, and today, we have a very special guest. We've got May Cat. Hello, that's me. <laughs> Yay, welcome! <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> May, you're starting to develop a little bit of a brand with certain POV uh, podcasts because uh, the movie we are talking today is uh, is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Yeah, so I uh, did not realize that I have a Frankenstein theme going on. But you know what? It's very on brand, so I'm ready. Yeah, when you were on Screen Snark, you were talking about it, too. Uh, but for listeners at home, uh, what do you, you got going on? Like, where would people know you from? Yes, hello, my name is May Cat. I am a screenwriter. I write mostly horror movies and cartoons. Uh, so the audience out there may know me from stuff like Transformers Cyberverse, um, Marvel Rising, uh, Critical Role, Legend of Vox Machina, which is still upcoming, and um, Transformers Kingdom, which is coming out uh, in July 2021. Uh, it's just a, a wonderful resume right there, and I feel so... Why, well, thank uh... you. <laughs> So so not up to snuff <laughs> for my own. Oh brain. no! Don't worry about it. <laughs> we we bow down um, to May. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm extremely extremely lucky, and maybe a little bit talented. We're not worthy. <laughs> We're not worthy. Oh please. Yeah. So so when we uh, I reached out to you after uh, after you participated in our uh, our network sort of like gushing about video games, which is fun and games uh, side quest program. Um, and yes. we were discussing movies to talk about. And you mentioned Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which I had heard a lot of people say, like, ugh, that movie. And I haven't seen this movie since I was, like, 12. And I didn't really remember it that well. I just remember being like, oh, yeah, it was, like, kind of cool to do, like, slightly more realistic takes on some stuff. Realistic is in quotes here. Um, and then <laughs> also, like, somewhat closer to the book stuff rather than just big, like, lurching monster kind of thing. Um, but I, I, I haven't thought about it in 24 years. And then uh, and then I watched it. And I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's funny because we were discussing, like, what movie could we talk about? And, like, we, we threw a couple at each other back and forth. And I was just like, well, you know, whatever. If it's Frankenstein, I'll be able to talk about it for at least an hour. And I, too, hadn't really thought about my what I remembered of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So I think it's all been a... Um, a rude awakening? Yeah. I, I want to read a quote because I think this sums up a lot about this movie and like where some things go weird. Uh, so on the Wikipedia page, they have a quote from Frank Darabont who wrote the script. And that actually also kind of blew me away when I realized it was a Frank Darabont script. Um, but his quote is just fucking incredible. There's a weird doppelganger effect when I watch this movie. It's kind of like the movie I wrote, but not at all like the movie I wrote. It has no <laughs> patience for subtlety. It has no patience for quiet moments. It has no patience, period. It's big and loud and blunt and rephrased by the director at every possible turn. Cumulatively, the effect was a totally different movie. I don't know why Branagh needed to make this big, loud film. The material was subtle. Shelley's book was way out there in a lot of ways, but it's also very subtle. I don't know why it had to be this operatic attempt at filming. Shelley's book is not operatic. It whispers at you a lot. The movie was a bad one. This was my Waterloo. This is where I really got my ass kicked most as a screenwriter. Branagh really took the brunt of the blame for that film, which was appropriate. That movie was his vision entirely. If you love that movie, you can throw all your roses at Ken Branagh's feet. If you hated it, throw your spears there too, because that was his movie. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is a distancing if I've ever heard. It's just like... I wrote it, but that's no, not you never. Know what? That's fair because watching this movie, I could not get over one. 
Kenneth Branagh should not have like, played the part. But, but like, I, I, I just don't think he should direct himself. In well, hang on. But, like, like, we again. can't just gloss over that. Like, Victor Frankenstein is supposed to be at most in his early 20s. And yes, Kenneth and he's Branagh 34 30, when he made this movie. He is 34. Oh, okay, but I'm going to defend him and say that he at least has one thing. Ego. <laughs> In, in terms yeah. of that, he he's definitely got the ego, and so does Victor. So that's at least common ground. So if only if only that ego translated into any sort of acting. Oh, Ooh, oh I'm gonna I'm gonna, burn. I'm gonna hurt myself while I talk about this movie. <laughs> but like, my notes when watching this movie were like, wait, is this a musical? At multiple points, I was like, it's certainly vamping like a musical. It's like at all these spots where it is, like the the resurrection scene of the monster. Uh, oh feels God. like it should be a musical number. And the, the the real term here that like really hits it on the head is operatic filmmaking. Like it is shot like an opera. It is lit like an opera. If you were doing an opera, this is how you would make it. The sets were very operatic too. Like that giant hall where everyone's dancing in that later on, you know, he's carrying Elizabeth's body through. Like I almost like I was looking at it and I was like, the walls look like they're painted on. Like, I feel like I met the New York City Ballet, and this is a set, like a very, like, avant-garde set for, like, the Nutcracker or some weird modern ballet. Like, I, oh, absolutely. even the sets had that feel to it, like, very, like, drawn out, very opera, very, yeah, you're right. Yeah, like that big stairwell at, at like, the Frankenstein Castle that has, like, no guard railing on the side, and it's just, like, going up into this, like... <laughs> nebulous loft it looks like a film set or, or rather like a like an opera set yeah yeah and it, the acting too it's like all the acting is for the audience in the back that doesn't exist except for robert de niro so it's really weird when you or you're just having scenes with a monster and it suddenly feels like a movie for like five seconds and then you cut back to kenneth brana or helen bonham carter and they're just screaming lines at you yes <laughs> Which it also like even even in the first um, in the first act when um, when when Kenneth Branagh is having the first scene with with the captain whose name I cannot remember right now because my brain is shot Ca- Captain Hubris thank you um, and uh, and so they're having a like the conversation like that those were two different tones <laughs> it was two different acting someone was in a film and someone was in an opera. <laughs> Just well, in wait, their but, first conversation, and well, that was interesting. We should talk about that framing device for a moment because um, <laughs> it is it is a lot. <laughs> like, I mean, so this movie comes off at the heels of the Bram Stoker's Dracula, which was a Francis Ford Coppola movie, which is very weird. But it is weird in a really fascinating way, and like it's clearly... operatic too, but in a very successful way. <laughs> right. I wonder if it was a studio note to be like, "Be more like this movie," and it was like, "Uh." I'm a stage actor, and I don't know how to do that for the cinema. Here we go. Well, like, there there are tons of things that that movie did well that I just wish they had brought over to it. Like, basically, like, if they had done that movie's style here, I would have actually been super down for it. Um, mm-hmm. But some of the things that that movie did poorly also happen here, such as the special effects with the boats and so forth. Like, it's, <laughs> uh, it does not look good. And then, uh, like, it's this very over-the-top, and, it, you know, it's it's not a subtle metaphor, here or in the classic text of like, yeah, we're venturing forth to the north, uh, testing the boundaries of exploration, um, and ultimately this tale proves that no, no, <laughs> mankind should uh, take a step back. We be, be afraid of exploration. Um, but the whole like we're going to mutiny, like we're going crazy, going further. It's so over the top. And then Branna shows up, and then the monster murders their dogs. Which I wondered where they got their dogs. Like all of it's just, <laughs> it's a lot. You don't take a team of sled dogs with you when you go sailing to the north on an expedition? Case? I like, mean, they might, but they actually don't set it up until we're, like, that, all of a sudden they're, like, on the ice and they, all of a sudden they, do, they just have a team of dogs. I know, but that's, like, my go-to packing for exploring the far north. <laughs> like, I'm, like, seven dogs. There's a version of this opening that totally functions. Because I love, I actually love imagining, like... You're an audience member. It's 1994. You're going to go see Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, having not read the book because how many people have actually read the book? And then the opening scene takes place in the Arctic. You're going to be sitting there going like, what the heck is going on? And like, that's a very good moment to have to, to give to an audience. But then it just like it can't 
it it just drags but then doesn't and then it's drama but it's not and it's just like the idea that you're paralleling this guy exploring the north pole with a guy who stitched together dead body parts and made a new person and then promptly abandoned that person is it's it's just like i understand the parallel and it works in the book but it cannot work in this movie it's crazy. And and we get some like terrible stuff going on here too. Like they the they're already deadline is a really rough one. And when Victor like <laughs> drops his name, it's very much like the same as Benedict Cumberbatch in Star Trek Into Darkness where it's just <laughs> like my name is Khan. It's like my name is Victor Frankenstein and I half expected like a lightning bolt. Uh, and like yeah, my God, I would have loved that. I would have <laughs> loved that. Honestly, a lightning bolt would have improved this movie. <laughs> Because I'd be like, oh, they're really leaning into this. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, if you took, like, two more steps into camp, this could be a cult classic for me, but it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, because you could go further with that. I mean, like, because, like, fundamentally, I'm actually not that upset with the script. I, like, I I have some, like, thoughts about how you can, like, tweak it here or there. And obviously, the deliveries are way over the the top, but... It, like, it's functionally fine in terms of the story structure because it's pretty damn close. Um, and there's a lot of, like, set design stuff that it's, like, it's also pretty damn close. But, like, between somewhat realistic designs for things, like the way that, uh, real, and again, realistics in quotes, but, like, having, like, the, the electric eel stuff, having, you know, like, having, like, <laughs> this element of, like, this, like, steampunk kind of vibe to everything, like, is very cool, but then it's, like, offset by... Again, these things that feel like they're just like flats of a of a stage set uh, being like mm-hmm. positioned for for the camera, um, and the lighting is all very flat, uh, and all of the actors are actors that you would cast for the stage production and not for the movie production because we can see that no one is the right age. Uh, it it yeah, just doesn't it's all per- work. It's every choice is very perplexing. Like I, I'm sorry, just to take a second, is there? Is there a moment where I, we go through and just be like, this is what I would do to improve it? Or is this just complaining right now? Uh, this is just complaining right now. We will get into, <laughs> like, quote, unquote, pitch territory later. Um, and okay, we'll, cool. we'll try okay. to, like, before we round out the, the or rather, b- before we get into the pitch area, we will try to, like, take a minute and be like, I like this thing. But, like, at the moment, we're gotcha. all just like, okay. I like, I my first response upon seeing this movie was, this is bad. And I texted Sam. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Either way, I miss having only vague memories of this movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I there's a p- there's a piece of hubris in me that enjoys that I have inflicted this movie upon you all by choosing it, but I I too am a victim <laughs> of this movie. Much like Victor, I am also a victim of what I have done. That is true. You have unleashed yeah. a monster on all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Why did it have to be this? And and you know what? I- I sympathize, I sympathize with this monster, much like I sympathized with the monster of the book when I read it when I was yeah, younger. Yeah, you can see you can see a version of this that totally works, but it's just like every every choice is the wrong choice, yeah, and it the, keeps making shockingly worse choices. You, you're halfway through, and you're like, okay, I, it's getting it's 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 hitting a good pace, and then it's just like, no, never mind. Yeah, there are some <laughs> gems in here. There there are good there are good bones to it. It just goes awry in a lot of delivery and stuff like that. Like, I actually thought that, like, De Niro's monster, there were moments that were really, like, nice. And I was like, oh, I really like this. And there were actually times where I I forgot it was De Niro, which is the highest compliment I can pay to someone that has that much name recognition. And so I thought, oh, yeah, you know, this is, like, this is okay. But, again, that was so weird because there were moments where, like, when they're talking to each other, we're just, they're on such different wavelengths. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just, and I actually, like, I told Case that I wish I had more time with the monster. And I think that's just because I kind of want it less Brenna. Like, I want it less Kenneth yes. Brenna. Like, I want it more oh, De yeah. Niro. Because I want it, I also, like, I think, so I read Frankenstein when I was pretty young. Um... I was probably in junior high and I really empathized with the monster. Like I really like, I felt bad for him. Like I was like, he didn't ask to be born. Like this is a messed up situation for this poor creature. And like his dad abandoned him, left him to figure out the world 
like on his own with everybody being prejudiced against him. And I just think that he's definitely more interesting than Victor, you know, in general, like just my general opinion of the monster. But I also, I just thought De Niro would fit the, like a film format better. <laughs> so I wanted more Absolutely. I mean, like that's Brana's ego definitely coming in. Like, yeah, the Frankenstein's monster is the star of the show. Um, you don't even get to, to the monster till forty six minutes into the movie. Like I stopped 46 and checked. Six minutes. Yeah, I checked where the monster actually is created. It's forty six minutes into the movie. God, we finally get the monster. So, like, you're in the Arctic, and then you're like, and I don't think that the backstory is bad, right? Like, you want to know that he's fallen in love with Elizabeth because you need him to have like an emotional connection to her because the death needs to be. And like seeing his mom die, although honestly, like, it, it wasn't like translated enough for me that this is some sort of like, um, push to make him really want to create to make sure that he creates life and like resurrection. Right. Yeah, I yeah. have a note when that, like at that phase there of his life where it's like, he vacillates from traumatized and crazy with boyish frolicking. Like he's like rolling around and being like, look at that cloud. There's going to be lightning coming here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all interspersed between this. Like, yeah, it's like, yay science, but he's like, too happy, right? Yeah, like, I, I I don't get the vibe that he's, like, haunted. Right, he's not haunted by losing his mother. He's not haunted by this thing. Like, like he, like he it seems that he's actually dealt with this death really well. So his obsession with, like, creating life and resurrection and that kind of thing, it's not, like, he just seems like a guy who's, like, obsessed with playing God, which is fine, I guess, but it's well, not. That's, that's that. That would be fine. Like there's certain adaptations of the book, and you can even read the book as this. That it's in the text. But like Victor Frankenstein is a cruel man. Like he, what he does to his monster is cruel, and the hubris he holds is cruel. And so again, it's just Kenneth Branagh's ego to be like, I'm going to make this movie, but I'm going to make Victor Frankenstein the most sympathetic person in the room. It's like, no, no, no. The most sympathetic person in the room is the monster. That's how. That is yeah. by design, sir. Um, and I don't know why you want to compete with this creature that is has built in sympathy, no matter what you do. It's it, uh, uh, uh. yeah, yeah. You're right because like the truth is like Victor does everything without really thinking, right? He's just like, oh, like it'll just be amazing. Like science is just amazing, and I'll be able to do this. And blah, 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 blah. and then when the monster is born, he's like, ugh, that that's gross. Oh my god, that he's a terrible beat, scientist. That terrible. beat of just. Him just looking up at the monster as it hangs above him, Christ-like, and that's the moment he's like, what have I done? It makes no goddamn sense. Yeah. Like, I understand what is supposed to be happening, but, like, nothing about the way that is shot, what is actually happening, none of that actually translates into being, a, a, like, horrified by what you've done. Yeah. Well, none. and there's, like, two emotions in that scene, because there, there's the element of being like, well, this was a fucking d- disaster, like, because, like, the, the creature at first, like, seems to be dead or, like, an imbecile or whatnot. And he, like, writes it off and he's, like, really depressed about it. Um, and then he's like, it's also an abomination. I, sh- I what, Why did I play with nature? Why did I pretend to be God? Like, those are two different takes. And both of them are bad scientist takes. Uh, because at the first one, it's like, well, sure, if, if he's alive, but, it, like, maybe he has brain damage. Like, you can, you can do better in the future. Like... Got to iterate I mean, on it. Like that's 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 basic science right there. Like you, you could take a- you could take that criticism and apply it to almost every scene. Like there are just t- there's a hat on a hat, and they're conflicting hats. There's two. The, the, there's multiple motivations. They conflict each other. None of them make sense. It's the it's, you're trying to have your cake and eat it too problem. Yeah, yeah. It's just like you got to pick a lane and stick to it. Is he? trying to res is he trying to create this creature to create a better version of man out of his own hubris so he's god or is he trying to do it to resurrect his loved ones those are two different thoughts and you can't have both but the movie sure as hell tries yeah all all the time it is the meme why not both (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) kenneth brown is in 1993 just like but why not both can i be the hero I can be inconsiderate and a ravishing lover. I started to develop a theory um, earlier in the movie, and this is obviously this doesn't play out later on, but where Elizabeth actually doesn't like Victor and is like pretending to be like 
oh yes, I'll marry you once you finish school to like, buy herself time. <laughs> Because she's like, no, we can't sleep together until I'm married. Oh, I will marry you once you go off and go to college and finish school. Like, at like throughout this whole, like that whole scene, she's like trying to duck him, and then later on, she's like totally happy with him. But like it, like that in that earlier scene, I'm like, okay, okay, I could, I could, I could work with this one. Like a scenario where Victor desperately wants to control everything and totally does not understand that no one wants in like anything to do with him. Yeah, that's a nice take. I dig that. Also, like, the idea of Elizabeth and Justine are, like, back in Geneva, like, totally having a romance without him. That's my take. Ooh, I, like <laughs> I like that, that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, because they have this, like, very weird, like, look at this, like, wonderful little house to return to kind of vibe that is just so strange. Yeah. It's all it's all so strange. None of it really makes a lot of sense. Like, that. I think the fact that they have that title crawl even before the prologue really indicates how nothing is being successfully communicated in this movie, that you needed, like, a two- or three-paragraph title crawl to just be like, hey, did you know at the turn of the 19th century people were getting real into science? I mean, like, honestly, like, they did that, and then they did 46 minutes about how Victor was really into science. (laughs) Science! Don't you understand? It's power. Like, honestly, like... Because, like, they do, like, the first half of this movie, like, the, if, like almost entire first act after the Arctic is basically, like, showing how Victor grew up in this home that is very, like, carefree with magnanimous parents who take in an orphan, who are people of science and free thinkers and, like, you know, and his father's very proud of his achievements and, you know, he's very supported uh, but it's like all about it's all about and like the great deeds he's going to do, right? Like that's forty six. Like you don't need that that thing, right? Like you you don't like honestly. It's pretty much yeah, a man. Movie. It's shocking. So you could do it's one shocking. or the other. <laughs> yeah, you can cut that whole first act down into like fifteen minutes if you really wanted to. Maybe you could give twenty. Give like I don't know. Throw in throw in a scene of making out. I don't know. Oh, can I wait? Hang on before I forget. <laughs> Can I put a pin in the fact that they call Elizabeth and Victor sister and brother like multiple times? Oh my times, God. Yes. Which it's is so look, awkward. I, I get it. I get that that's the setup in the book. I don't ask you to change that. And I don't even ask you to ignore it. But maybe like mention it once and then stop saying the word sister, especially as you're proposing to her so that she can go from your sister to your wife. Yeah, like, like, stop. <laughs> I, I think he even says like, Grow, grew up as brother and sister, now husband and wife, or something to that effect. Either way, um, this is a category on Pornhub right now. Like, it's so uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. I, it, also, it, yeah, I, it's such an easy omission, too. Just don't say the word sister. That's all you have to do. When they were dancing, like, outside, I kept, <laughs> and they were getting closer and closer, I kept being like, hey, guys, like, I, can you get away from the windows? Like, I just don't want the other guests to see. And I don't know why I kept thinking that. Like, they're forbidden love. Like, I'm like, please hide it away. Like, this is uncomfortable for me. Which was ridiculous. Because everyone was cool. Everyone was fine with it. Like, everyone was cool with yeah. these siblings. I mean, the the they other way to on. fix that is instead of saying, you're my sister, you're my brother, you say, you're, you're a sister to me. You're a brother to me. And then it's less creepy, at least. At, yeah, at the very least. Yeah, there's a little. It's just separation such a weird there. thing, because it just kept coming up. Like you think you le- you leave it behind in the first act, but then they run, they get back together, and like it, like the word sister is said multiple times in the second half of this movie, and I'm like, why? Stop reminding me. I almost forgot. Yeah, I think the only time you really need to say it is when she's first introduced. Like this, this girl's going to come here, and you should treat her as a sister. Treat her well. Done. And that's it. Yeah. Done. Like that's. That's the one time, and then don't talk about it again. Because I was just like, because he does. You're right. You, you want to make it weird? What? Or weirder, I should say. Oh god. So behind the scenes, Kenneth Branagh uh, was oh. at the time married to Emma Thompson, um, but the uh, about a year after this, that that marriage ended because he had been having an affair with none other than Helena Bonham Carter. <gasps> Which started on this set, which I kind of feel like is the reason for the weird love scene. I like, <laughs> I don't think that it was necessary at all. Like, I think, like, it's fine to be, like, 
I like, and I'm not a prude. Like, I'm I'm fine with sex scenes in general. But I just like I just felt like the the crotch grab over clothing for some reason I felt was excessive. Like, I was Isn't it like, wonderful when you're like watching a, mo- a scene in a movie or in TV and you're like, this is this is someone's kink, not to yeah. kink shame, just to be like, just to see it and know that this is someone is very into this. Yeah. yeah and I felt I and maybe it's also because I like I had knowledge going into watching this film that like this is where their affair started. And I just felt like this was his kink. Like this is the woman I am sleeping with behind my wife's back. And now I'm going to grab her crotch on camera <laughs> for everyone to see. <laughs> like, I was just like, like, yeah. Yeah, I, I had actually blocked out, but it's like, oh, right. There's like an extended sequence of him, like, on her ass, like, literally getting his, like, fingers up in her crack. And it was just like, no, stop, please. God damn it. I'm so mad I said those words just now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had, like, had erased the love scene from my mind because yeah it was tor- it was terribly shot and it was also just not even the worst thing i hated about this i don't know There's so much going on uh it, honestly it was also so out of left field right because like honestly at this point right he has reneged on the monster right the monster has asked him to make him oh, a dude. companion right which is terrible and then he won't do it because the material is someone he knows because He's an asshole. And um, not only someone he knows, someone who he kind of maybe could have saved. Yes, true. So there might be guilt there. But but then he like there's the weird scene in the church with the I I feel like it was like, you know, when you're watching a student film and they're like trying to (laughs) add they're like they're like, we're going to add some like pictures in the film because direction is all about pictures so they they have him but there's a cross right behind him and like like he's off center of the cross and he's there like he's resurrected someone and blah 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 and i was just like oh god this is like what is this anyway so there's that (laughs) scene and like elizabeth is like oh we got to get married we got to get married and so they get married right so you already know that the the monster has made this threat and he knows the monster has made this threat. And he still has time for sexy time. And Why just, would you let your guard down? Yeah. Why would you not just stay up all night and just be like, Elizabeth, I would I would want nothing more than to bone down with you right now. But we gotta we gotta put a pin in it for like at least a week. Our lives literally depend on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that wasn't like a subtle threat. That was like a very obvious like I will be with you on your wedding night. Like, right. that's it. <laughs> um, my favorite student film moment. Uh, I was watching the film with my with my fiance Natalie, and she she rewound this moment to make sure I saw it in full Technicolor. It's it's after the wedding, they get on a horse and they heroically like ride off into the woods because they're trying to escape the monster to like get. They're gonna go on a ferry to get away from him, um, and. The shot is the camera has is on the ground next to a sign that says fairy and it pa- and it like tilts up to see Frankenstein to see Victor and Elizabeth and another character come up and be like the fairy's gone sir and it's like it's just like yes the literal sign into the information it's like again once again a hat on a hat on a hat on a hat mm-hmm. P- yeah. pedestrian there are a lot of moments like that <laughs> honestly it's just like I don't know. It uh, wasn't his first movie either. Like no. I looked it up, he made like a three or four feature films beforehand, and I look. I don't. I I haven't seen them. I don't know if they are similar, if they have similar issues. But I was just so confused how how this movie got made. I, I wish I knew more because, or like like how Kenneth Branagh was like picked to be like. No, he's perfect to do. Like a cool steampunk, realistic esque version of this novel because it just seems like such a <sighs> such a weird choice. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And like I said, like there's things that I I do like about this movie. I don't I, I don't know. Like, is there more to vent about besides like all everyone is terribly cast aside from possibly De Niro uh, or and John Cleese? Side note, uh, somehow the most subdued performance in this entire movie. Is John Cleese. <laughs> Yeah, this this complaint section is definitely a uh, X all of the above. 
Yeah. I, you, I you, we could just go on and on. I, I actually thought, like, the moment of his uh, teacher and mentor being stabbed was pretty good. Um, I thought... Uh, but then, but then they ruin it with like his mentor <laughs> coming back as a voice voice ghost after he makes the monster. Oh my god! What was that? Was that a dream sequence? What was it? I'm not. I I think it was because he like had a fever. Like he wakes up in his like best friend's. Oh my god! Home. I I fucking love that. Like his when his friend and Elizabeth are like tending to him, and they were like, "It was real touch and go. You almost died." And he's like shirtless and obviously like the abs of a very healthy human being. And it's mm-hmm. like, what he 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 was not dying at any point. And I was there. I saw the whole damn thing. He was not sick. This is dumb. Right. They didn't even like you know like pale his face a little bit you know no he's still like tan and handsome and it's like what did the abs save his life I don't understand I I, I mean clearly he had worked out a lot for this movie because there's so many shirtless scenes where there's like it's like the only work that they do to have like dynamic lighting in this movie is to like make his abs have like just the right tone yes that's true again ego yeah. <laughs> uh, and speaking of, of friends Tom Hulls man like. It, <laughs> playing a college student and this is like 15 years after he was in animal house yeah man it's all very rough like every close-up of like these 20 year olds and you're just like this is the a man who is in his 30s this is like back to the future part two and it's really hard to ignore because it's not michael j fox but but again like there are things that i I do like about this movie and i think we should shift into like some of the praise because like there's so much and like like there are other parts that i'm like well why did they do this here but that's like pitch territory uh, so, like, good things. Like, De Niro usually gets uh, gets a shout-out. I think that, like, the eye makeup is really interesting. Like, his uh, the other eye that, like, they stitched onto him. Um, it, I, I think that looks pretty good. I think it's as as a an attempt to uh, reimagine the monster. Uh, without going into the sort of, like, Adonis that is in the book. Uh, but, you know, so to, to keep it like people pop like in pop culture are aware of. Um, but not do literally that sort of, like, classic uh, universal monster version i think they do a really good job in terms of like all the all the details going in there like him having two different legs that are different lengths and that's why he has like a weird oh yeah gait. that's genius like, mm-hmm. that's a nice touch in terms of being like frankenstein as we know him from the movies and he starts off like much more much more like the classic monster and then eventually he becomes more like the actual scary monster from the book and that those are that's good for de niro he's a good actor for that that like for that part uh I don't know what's going on with his accent in this movie. <laughs> I don't know what's going um, on with any of their accents. Like, no one... Like, like, he true, true. All over the place. Case, he had a concussion. That's what happened with his accent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, De Niro's um, at least, like... Or the the monster, at least. It's like, okay, yeah, well, you know, he just was raised from the dead. He probably is going to talk weird regardless. Like, I, I mentioned the, that I like the uh, the production design in terms of, like, Frankenstein's actual lab and, like, his work. Like, I... A lot of those are actually really good. I remember the commercial really well, like showing the eels moving around when he like feeds them and they're like all like uh, going after it and they have like this electrical effect. Oh shit, this is a, a thing we forgot to talk about. What is up with electricity in this movie? And having, Oh like, my god, wait, that's the pinnacle of having your cake and eating it too. That's the pinnacle of my hat on a hat problem because it, it wants to involve electricity because of the iconography surrounding, um, surrounding Frankenstein. But it also doesn't <laughs> like like to not i i have no idea what the deal is with a lightning bolt i don't know if universal monsters owns the concept of a lightning bolt in the same way that they own the likeness of the karloff monster but i was just like what in god's name are you doing <laughs> like is like don't involve electricity at all if you're going to give it to me in the form of electrical eels that i will constantly be wondering where the hell did you get those and what are you feeding them and how are you maintaining them and like what what is happening? Also, how much how ma- how many like baby births did you go to to get that much umbilical fluid? I know, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, a um, lot. Yeah, a lot. So like many a whole tank babies of that? had to what? get born. <laughs> so so many, so so many, so many births, so many things. Although All that's a, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing with this movie it's just a weird thing with this movie (laughs) it's a weird detail on top of the weird i just all the changes to the creation like some of them i like i do like the metal coffin and the steampunky nature but ultimately 
as with most of the changes in this from what I'm used to from like pop culture or the actual book, I'm just more, I'm left more going like, why? Like, if you're going to change this, why this way? I like the scene early, like the, the foreshadowing scene with the the monkey's paw, like <laughs> like a literal monkey's paw. Um, <laughs> I, I thought that was a cool sequence where like it seemed to still be acting on its own. And uh, like also it had the, like the super strength. Contrast that with the frog, which while adorable, when it like kicked open the glass was like, your your camera work there is just rough. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but like that scene was good setting up like cool, yeah. Like, like like we can keep a thing alive and also it can be really fucking strong. It is weird though that then immediately Cleese's character is just like I now that I've shown you this, forget it completely. Never talk of it again. <laughs> it ugh, makes no sense. I do really enjoy to me there's like two really good short films inside of this movie. And one of them is when the monster is, like, hiding out with that family. And suddenly it's, like, the sporadic, almost, like, chaotic editing of the first 46 minutes stops just to let you have, like, a normal-paced movie with De Niro learning how to be a person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love love that stuff. Loved all of it. And I, I actually am a real big fan of basically when Frankenstein and the monster speak, um, like, on that glacier mountain thing. To the end of it. Like, I actually am, like, cool with most of what happens. Yeah, I actually really liked the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I thought the end was really lovely, actually. And, and maybe that's because Kenneth Brenner was dead, and it was just an era <laughs> talking. And, um, but that last scene, like, I was just like, okay, like, this was, like, n- this was not the funnest movie to get through. But that scene was like worth like that like for me that was like a big payoff because I really enjoyed, you know, De Niro just kind of jumping in the water and like the captain being like, "Come with us," and he's like, "No, I'm done with man." And I was like, "Yeah, boy, you tell them empowerment, monster empowerment," and then just kind of swimming to go and die with his father. Like I was just like, you know, when he said that was my that that's my father, I was like, "Aw." Yeah. Yeah, that I hits. That hits real good. I felt it. I also really enjoyed the creature. I enjoyed the whole concept of of how they do the Bride of Frankenstein. I loved that it was a situation that the monster like forced him into by sacrificing Elizabeth and the, the like, it's almost comedic and it's going to be comedic when I call it this, but the air bud scene of like both the monster and Victor trying to get Elizabeth (laughs) to like pick one of them. But I actually, I loved it. I loved the dancing. I loved the design of the Bride of Frankenstein, where they were just like, "Fuck it, we can't, we can't do the cool Nefertiti hair, so we'll do the opposite mm-hmm. and just have it be no hair." Um, yeah, I think is genius, and I think Helen Bottom Carter's like killing it. Yeah, I thought they teased the Bride of Frankenstein hair too, because her hair up until that point is basically the Bride of Frankenstein hair. Uh, <laughs> True. But I also have a question about that, which is why did he cut off? Elizabeth's head and sew it to Justine's body. Justine's been dead for a while. If the only thing that they were missing was her heart, why not just take the heart? I think he he couldn't repair the rib cage was probably their logic. So yeah. much damage was done to the ribs and the and the lungs probably. I don't know. It could have there, there, it, It's for the wonders, creature like, design. There there's a part of me that wonders was this a scenario where uh he's always been like if I could take Elizabeth's face and Justine's body, that would be That'd be it. No. Which I could see Victor Frankenstein being that kind of a prick where it's like, well, if I'm going to re- resurrect her, I might as well make the best of both worlds. I, oh, I my think, God. oh, my I God. I think the worst part about you suggesting that is that the movie itself kind of suggests that Justine has the hots for Victor. Like, there is definitely, like, a moment where she's like, if he were mine, I would already be there. You need to go to him. And I was just like, oh, so just everybody loves him, huh? Mm-hmm. Everybody loves this man who has done absolutely nothing. Yeah, everybody yeah. loves him. Yeah. yeah. Um, I keep so, looking for good, but I keep also having bad things that I realize that we did forget to mention, which is like the Justine <laughs> death, I think is terrible. Uh, like, I don't understand why this mob went after her, especially when the, the evidence is so shallow. Like, it's, and also, who was who this mob to care about the the boy of the family that, she is a very integral part of like I, I i didn't get any of that and i know in the book it's like a bigger slow trial thing that like he could have like attempted to stop but like would have to reveal the monster i mean they spent 46 minutes on other stuff so yeah 
Yeah, it spent 46 minutes on other stuff. Well, it, it seems like they tried to speed up a thing to fix one problem. Exactly. And then created a, an entirely new one by just being like, well, what if they're all just pissed off and they lynch her? Like, it just feels... Done. Why would they do that to this woman in this circumstance? Like, it's so... Because peasants? Question mark? Yeah. I know yeah. that's the answer, even though, like, the movie does not bother to communicate that. I mean, the the only thing that they leave her behind with is the locket that belongs technically to Elizabeth. And I guess the kid ran off with it. I don't know if, like, the movie's inferring that that's enough evidence. I think it is, right? That's, like, the mob mentality was like, that's it for us. Yeah. Well, like, the police are like, we found the murderer. She had the locket in her hand. And it's like, well, what if she she was looking for him? Mr. Police, I gave you all the clues. Police are going to police, I guess. Yeah. No matter what time and period it is. <laughs> like, that would have actually been better, too. Like, oh, we found the murder. We shot her. <laughs> just, just be done with it. Don't, don't she tried to flee. Yeah, yeah. No, but then he would, they would have ruined her pristine body. She was body. a threat to us, so we shot her in the back. They had to hang her. I mean, that's a movie that th- th- this is 30 years or 25 years ahead of its time, then, <laughs> if, if they did that. I mean, I think in general, going back to the, the Bride of Frankenstein moment, though, I do think that, like, it was the one time that I thought the set was actually, like, pretty lovely. You know, like, I was just like, oh, this is, this is like, very lovely. There's something eerie, but but kind of beautiful. And them dancing, um, the way that they used to dance, like, kind of reconnecting. There, there actually felt, like, this, this sense of, there was actually good connection there, right? And um, where the rest of the movie felt like, these two actors were kind of yelling at you. It was actually very quiet. And so it was actually a really nice moment for both of those actors on screen. Um, I do think that the excessive blowing up of the bride <laughs> later on was a little weird. Like like one explosion because she has oil on her was enough, like setting the house aflame. But then she blew up again before she jumped out the window. Yeah, no, Victor Frankenstein filled her up with a bunch of chemicals. <laughs> and I explosive, like, explosive chemicals. I was like, wow, this is... What, she's... What, oh, a third explosion. Wow. <laughs> We're still going, ladies and gentlemen. And someone finally like jumps off of the stairs that has no railing. Like I've been like you've been waiting for the entire movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um. So I thought that was a little silly, but I, <laughs> in general, I actually liked the third act. Like <laughs> once once you get past the creepy uh, uh, sex scene, um, which normally I don't have a problem with sex scenes. I just had a problem with this one. No, absolutely. I was good after their wedding. Like, her being the bride of Frankenstein, her deciding that it was, like, realizing what had been done to her and be, knowing that that wasn't done with her consent and kind of just freaking the fuck out. Excellent. Yeah. Wonderful. I, lo- I love that she uh, she realizes that she's kind of being treated as an object and just pieces out. Yeah. So yeah. I thought I thought that was like really great. I thought that like I actually thought in that moment the desperation that Victor had, I thought that that was like the most real performance that Kenneth gave through this whole film, like and like watching her run away and being heartbroken, like that was probably the the best scene he had in this film. And um and so I just think like that whole latter half to like basically him being like his pyre um in the arctic the whole like last what like 15 minutes of the film was really good (laughs) that's my positive (laughs) no i i agree i agree and and that's where like the casting actually works really well like helena bonham carter and kenneth branagh both actually look fine at this stage of the movie like they're a married couple so like them being looking a little bit older looks fine like it feels fine to the audience if the movie started here and then like we had younger actors playing them in their youth like that would have been probably a more viable choice it's like but instead like we were supposed to like age with kenneth branagh playing like a 16 year old at one point well like what's the what is the time frame what is the time frame of this movie anyway it feels like it's maybe a year like he goes to college makes the monster it abandons the monster 
the monster learns how to talk and then he gets married. Like it, it feels very compact. I like your pitch at the idea of like, you could spread this out over like maybe a decade, but that's certainly not how the book is structured. And I don't think the movie bothered to think about itself in that way. I think Kenneth no. Branagh just straight up was like, no, I look 20. It'll be fine. I, I mean, even if he's just playing like Kenneth, Br- like even if he's playing Victor Frankenstein at 23 and they have younger actors for Victor Frankenstein at 18, I, I would still work. Yeah. A lot yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, it's a bummer because, like, like I, I, I realize that it is a a, a a weird movie with, like, lots of stuff going on, but I really like Bram Stoker's Dracula. Like, I, I understand, like, that there's a lot of areas where it's just, like, structurally strange. That there's a lot going on that to make it not appeal to audiences in the same way that, like, previous successes by Coppola uh, did. But it, I, I really wanted this to be that for this property uh, and it is such a bummer to me that it doesn't work that well yeah you really it has it has the makings to be like like a guillermo del toro frankenstein movie and it yeah. just fails utterly at every possible point so i have some thoughts about how this could have been better is there anything we you guys want to like talk about before we get into like the pitch territory uh Oh, I have I have like very small details, very nitpicky pluses, if you don't mind. Oh yeah, go for it. Yeah. Sure. As a long time just Frankenstein and all its iterations fan, I really enjoyed um the sort of the changes they made to Dr. Waldman, who is John Cleese's character, and kind of shifting him into a Dr. Pretorius territory. And Pretorius is the mad scientist from uh, 1935's Bride of Frankenstein, who is also dabbling in the creation of human beings. So to take Dr. Waldman, who is in the book, who is not not a reanimator, and then to imply that he was not only on that path, but totally basically almost did it. I was like really into that. And I was really into Victor using his brain as the monster's brain. Yeah. I like really, that detail. It, it didn't really go anywhere. Like you were waiting for a beat where like, you know, that something Dr. Waldman said to Victor is repeated through the monster's mouth, but now it has like a new context. Um, but that never happened. Cause like, God, God forbid this movie be that clever. Yeah, I can imagine if Waldman just played the recorder at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it would... Ah, genius. That's all you needed. You don't even need to write a goddamn line. Um, and in general, being a big fan of creature design and creatures, the the integration of chi and the integration of acupuncture as part of how we're going to make this monster come to life, I thought was really cool. And not, and it wasn't like handled in, in a, in a horrible, like secrets from the far East. Like, thank goodness. Thank goodness. It was just like, no, the, these philosophers believe in these kind of energy channels and it was handled with grace. Shockingly. Yeah. I I like Um, that too. Yeah. I was really into that. And those are my very nitpicky pluses. (laughs) It's weird to describe nitpicky as like the positive part. I know it's, it's very, very minor little details that I, as a very, very deep Frankenstein fan, really appreciate. <laughs> Sam, is there anything that you wanted to talk about before we get into it? No, let's just get into it. I, I, All right. th- I feel like, I feel like I, there are things that I liked, but like, yeah, let's just get into it. <laughs> sure. Uh, before we do though, we should probably take a moment to give a shout out to one of the shows on our network. So, uh we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, we're going to have some pitches. Hey there, Screen Beans. Have you heard about Screen Snark? Rachel, this is an ad break. They aren't Screen Beans until they listen to the show. Fine. Potential Screen Beans. You like movies and TV shows, right? I mean, who doesn't? Screen Snark is a casual conversation about the movies and television shows that are shaping us as we live our everyday lives. That's right, Matt. We have a chat with at least one incredible guest every episode, hailing from all walks. We've interviewed chefs, writers, costumers, musicians, yoga teachers, comedians, burlesque dancers, folks in the film and TV industry, and more. We'd be delighted for you to join us every other Monday on the Certain POV Podcast Network. Or wherever you get your podcasts, fresh and tasty off the presses. What? what? That's... No, that's not... Can I call them Screen Beans now? Fine. Screen Beans! So tune in and we'll see you at the movies or on a couch somewhere. Because you're a whole Screen Beans now. She will be mine. 
All right, and we're back. So let, let's let's talk some ideas. Can I, I've got I so I don't have like a, a full rewrite. If I, if I may take the lead on this one, I I've got a vibe that I think would go really well. Sure. Uh, I say uh, cautiously optimistic. So so first up, this movie is lit like an opera, and I think it needs to be lit like it's a black box theater. Like I think we need like really dark shadows with like cool accent lighting on things. Like, can you imagine if this whole movie was like dark with like candlelight kind of illumination, which would feel like Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula? Like, have like really intense kind of lighting going on for everything at the spots where you need it, and have everything else hidden in shadow. Because right now the movie is very like flat. Yeah, I think that would that's that's an excellent note. And then have a young fucking cast. And I, I realized that this is a <laughs> Kenneth Branagh movie. And like, it's like in terms of realistic pitches, it, Kenneth Branagh directing this movie, he is never going to let himself not be the star. And so I don't know if you could make that one work, but if you fired Kenneth Branagh, uh, <laughs> and, and as a producer, we're like, uh, okay, we made a terrible mistake. Cast young fucking people. Like, can you imagine if this, like, this exact script, if they were all fucking young and sexy and illuminated? where, like, their sweat glistened appropriately and everyone was just, like, sexy as hell um, with this exact script. Oh, my God. You're, you're almost describing the Daniel Radcliffe Frankenstein movie. Ooh, I haven't seen that one. <laughs> I saw that drunkenly. Uh, it was a situation where my, my fiancé was out of town and I was feeling particularly lonely, so I just put that on. And I remember getting very... I oscillated between impressed and enraged. Um, so at least a deeper emotional reaction than what I got out of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's like my, my biggest thing on this one where I'm like, all right, well that, I feel like that would really work. I feel like it's so jarring when we go to the monster's perspective, as much as I like the scene up until when the, the parents come back and Frankenstein's in the house and they like hit him and they're like, we have to leave. And he runs away and then immediately comes back and they're already gone. <laughs> um, was like that aside from that being weird like I like that scene but it like feels weird from this like mostly Frankenstein's mostly Dr. Frankenstein's perspective kind of movie but I don't know mm-hmm. like if, if if you have maybe like like I said young hot people this could all work uh, but I but what I really think this movie needs is to really make it feel like Frankenstein has to do this which he doesn't throughout this whole movie like this whole movie it it seems like he just sort of stumbles into reanimating life and every now and then gets obsessed but it's like obsessed the way I got obsessed with like D&D when I started playing D&D and I like read up all the (laughs) stuff that happened before and like but like not like obsessed like the way like my life's goal is like D&D it's not (laughs) yeah uh, yeah no and like I feel I feel like that was an issue that they struggled with just because in the book it's kind of like it is an obsession, but it is much more just like a casual, like, I thought I could do this, so I did. And then I did, and it was awful. You know, it's not, it doesn't get the movie treatment where it's like, it needs to be like the singular goal. So I can see the movie like struggling with doing, maintaining that. But like, yeah. it it tries and it almost succeeds. Like the setup that you lost your mother tragically during childbirth and you have this remnant of her that is your little brother like, that's a great setup, and you don't follow through with that except for, like, w- awkward dialogue mentions and, like, the m- most hilarious, like, scene of, like, looking at her grave and promising, like, never again or whatever. Right, and that's the thing. Yeah. I that, that is actually my biggest uh, thought here, which is that move the mother's death later. Or, here's a pitch, have him participate in trying to save her. Because if he's already, like, about to become a medical student, like, he could have been in the room with his father trying to save her. And you would get that moment. It's in re- it's in uh, Stuart Gordon's Reanimator where you, like, she's clearly dead, but you have Victor, like, not being able to let go and being like, no, no, we can save her. Yeah, yeah, that, would, kinda, be, that yeah. would be great yeah, yeah. as well. Um, like, I, I think these are both, like, th- th- those would work together really well. But, like, also, I think that, like, the scenes that happen after, before he goes to college, need to happen before the mom dies. Like, him yeah, studying yeah, power, right. him doing, like, all the stuff with Elizabeth, like, everything needs to happen earlier in the timeline. Like, them, like, going, uh, I probably wouldn't do the lightning bolt scene, where they're like, look at that <laughs> If you're not gonna, gonna do... If you're not going to do a goddamn lightning bolt later, don't waste my time with lightning bolts. What are you yeah. doing? D- d- yes, but like e- like whatever scene you put in its place, d- 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 like look at this electric eel. It's so cool. Uh, <laughs> he's at a fish market and he's like, ooh, that's that shocked me. <laughs> what what else could this be applied for? <laughs> do you guys remember or- that in that scene that he's like showing Elizabeth is 
like playing around with what is ultimately going to be the antenna for the lightning scene. Like there is an electric eel in that scene. Like the the little like water gun that she uses on him. He's like, oh, that's for the oh, eels. Yeah, water seals, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So he's already got eels. Like it's it's just such a weird detail to imagine that. Oh my god, this guy's been collecting eels for like at least two years. I mean, maybe that's yeah. his real obsession. Collecting eels. So his, his general idea about power and so forth, like which they are, they set up as like as explanation for later when they're like, "Oh, I could reanimate a body. I just never figured out a good power source." And he's like, "I studied power." Ah, um, have you tried eels? Well, have that all before the mom <laughs> dies, so that when he is then go, like literally goes crazy from the mom and like is becomes obsessed with death, like have that be stuff that was that was his passion before and now his passion is like reanimating life or or like conquering death or whatever it is like but but have all this like scientific pursuits and this sort of like altruistic i'm going to make the world a better place kind of vibe going on before that and then with the mom's death and i love your idea that have him be there trying to save her i was actually kind of surprised that he wasn't frankly when i was watching the movie um but like it like have him be in the room with them like have him be covered with blood have him be trying to figure out what he can do to like save her life maybe even can maybe even do some stuff with like if you shock a frog like it's body parts like move maybe he's like does tries to do something desperate with his mom um hey and then bring he goes, that eel in the room put it on your mom's chest <laughs> yeah and that i i love that idea because you also put the family in a position or at least his father to like know that there is some some not sinister but there is something going on with your son where you're like oh you're willing to cross lines that that other people are not willing to cross and it's good i think for the family to like be aware of that otherwise they have these rose-colored glasses of a character that the you know us in the audience are like this guy's an asshole like what is going on yeah Yeah. especially if it's just the dad and him in the room so like maybe the dad like sees it but the rest of the family doesn't and they all they all have this like warm vision of of victor um hell yeah and then when the monster comes for the dad he's like not surprised because you don't see that scene you just see that the dad is dead and the monster probably killed him but like to have that moment where you're like the father like meets you know his son's greatest sin yeah i think that would have been amazing i mean honestly i like the idea like now that i said it i said it as a joke but i kind of like the idea if we're gonna go with eels of him bringing an eel in to try to shock her at her chest because it kind of would make people in the beginning because it's very early people be like oh it's kind of like our paddles right like he's trying to like resuscitate her the way like we resuscitate people it's not in a way that kind of works but like we will be like oh that seems like decent science and then we see him go too far later on where like the obsession is like so incredible and he's got apparently a tank of millions of eels because i don't even know how his small tank really anyway that's not the point um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm not getting too sciencey here, but what I'm saying is, is that I feel like in general, like that would also have like, this is very early on where like the father could think like, oh, that's crazy. But we as modern like watchers could be like, oh no, but we use paddles to like shock people alive. So he's like onto something, you know, it may not be something that actually worked and it may not be like the actual science that is like perfect but yeah we actually kind of do do that so he is brilliant in a way and then what happens when brilliance gets taken too far yeah no there definitely needs to be like way more setup that he is a genius or or he's brilliant in some way because there's just not enough setup like the, the the fucking like lightning scenes are supposed to be like look at him he's so smart but like you really do need to see him amongst his peers excelling in ways that they are not because of his genius. Right. Um, it's it, that's such a basic, uh, such a basic experiment, right? It's like, it's like Bill Nye took you out to like capture. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, okay, let's do this on our, you know, so um, yeah, I, I feel like, cause that's the whole thing, right? He's brilliant and he's someone who's brilliant that goes. So, so too they far. say, <laughs> well, right. you know, it's it, what happens when someone's brilliant and you know you encourage them and they're also an asshole you know they go a little too far yeah, yeah. could i could i uh come at the pitching with 
I know I know your podcast is set up so it's like what can you do to fix what's already there but like I'm a screenwriter and I only know how to fix this from like the foundations up and if yeah, you go don't for mind, it, go for it. Like look, you need to decide what this movie is. Is this a horror movie? Is this an opera? Like we've we we talked an hour about this, but like the tonality is so all over the place that it really just never finds its footing and it never gives you like you don't know what you're watching and you don't know how to consume it and you don't know how to feel about it. Am I supposed to be sympathetic to Victor? I can't, I literally cannot tell who is the protagonist. Usually in a Frankenstein movie, the monster is the protagonist, but here he's murdering children and we're not like with him on that journey of why and how, and why he's doing that. So like, is he the villain? But Victor's an asshole. Like, and the tonality of like, occasionally there would be a horror beat, but not really. And then sometimes there's an action sequence and sometimes it's just heroic shots of Kenneth Branagh riding a horse. Like you need to fucking pick your lane and stick to it. Especially if you want to make changes to a story, especially if you're adapting something and particularly adapting something that has many adaptations. If you're going for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, do it. Don't, don't half do it. Like the whole movie is just half done in everything it attempts to do and every change in every creative way. Um, so yeah, like <laughs> fire Kenneth Brana or just recast Victor and like, you know, decide internally, what is this? What am I doing here? What are we trying to say with this? Yeah. I yeah. totally agree with that. I, I feel like you got to pick a lane, right? You gotta, you have yeah. to pick whether this is about hubris and power or if this is about specifically like, you know, the fear of loss and death and wanting to cheat death. Um, uh, because, and, and here's the thing, if like, like you said, and I think this is, I thought that was brilliant piggybacking on you. If you have him in the room trying to save his mom and then he watches his mentor die, that could be traumatic enough to push someone to the level of like, well, I'm going to find a way to cheat death forever. And I'm going to find a way to resurrect, like reanimate it like a body and make life. And then we can do that for others. And then no one will ever have to feel what I feel after losing my mother and this mentor and, and make that. And really, honestly, the first half of this film, um, if it focused more on that that would be enough to allow you to have Victor be somewhat sympathetic because that gives you, uh, you know, kind of like the crux of why someone would take something too far and become like way too obsessed with something that they shouldn't mess with. Yeah, and- no, I mean, like, you know, with with more skilled hands, usually a Frankenstein story becomes a parallel. Like this man either through loss or hubris and arrogance, like creates this person and then abandons it. And then the monster becomes a parallel story with him. And they both start to experience similar story beats. And you, you watch as like, you watch as this innocent creature in the monster is turned into a similar, a similar evil person as Victor Frankenstein. Um, but like that doesn't really happen because the movie is so obsessed with making Kenneth Branagh's Victor look like a good guy. Um, and then we, as like modern audiences who know this story are just like, no, fucking Victor Frankenstein's not the good guy in this, in this fucking story. What are you doing? Yeah, he's, he's not. And, and I think also like in general, I think the other thing that I just feel like needs to happen is that we just need to spend a little more time with the monster. And also I felt like the rejection scene was not, I don't know. Like I wanted a little more from it. Like Like, why does he, why does he reject the monster? There's like nothing there to indicate what is fueling that decision. Like it's like, you don't even get a good look at him. You don't even know if it's like, cause he's just hideous. Is that it? Like what? Well, cause he like goes into the rafters and then he's like birth defects. And it's like, how do you know? Like, how do you know? Like, as a scientist, you would have to spend some time testing out what you've created, right? Like, like if he assumed he was dead, right? 
and just didn't yeah, check. Like Although I don't know why you wouldn't check, right? Because you've spent like <laughs> months locked up in a house with rotting flesh, sewing it together. Like I would definitely check, right? But mm-hmm. <laughs> like I would find a way to get a really tall ladder and get my monster down and be like, oh shit, where did I go wrong? Because this is like your goal, right? Like you think you either think that you want to play God or this is an obsession to try to cheat death, then that's a real obsession, right? That's a real goal. So you're going to want to bring that fucking monster down and figure out what's up with it. (laughs) You know, like, oh, did I kill it? Like when it went flying into the air? Like, you know, and maybe there needed to be more to that scene. There needed to be more than just like the, uh, like now he's hanging like Christ and I resurrected him student film moment there needed to be an actual rejection because he thought he was stupid because he didn't speak like the monster has to feel that rejection from its father because when it's born it's fairly innocent right like I think the thing is that in the script or in this movie they kept trying to bring up this idea that maybe the monster was being affected by the different parts that were sewn together and who was he really which is very philosophical and and the monster in different iterations feels this way right and you see this also mimicked in other science fiction stuff after um this book but i was just like we don't we don't get a moment to see like the father acknowledge and reject the monster Really, like he just walks away and then says his mean things while he's walking in the book, which I hate all of the the writing speaking out loud moments. Like I, totally oh my god, I forgot. Out. Yeah, I would have totally cut out the letter writing sequence, which is just <laughs> Elizabeth and him like taking a pen and like making it go across the page, but not really writing and saying their words completely aloud. Like I totally a, forgot like, they did that. Well, like, and again, that feels like an opera a, right there. Like uh, also, it's a film. You can do a voiceover, right? Like, why are their mouths moving? Like, this is not theater. Their their mouths do not need to move. And also, they were just like unnecessary. It's like like I would cut that. Like that's my pitch. I would definitely cut that. There's so much in the first half of this film in the first forty six minutes that I would just tighten up. And then I would give more breathing room. I would actually like add a a moment where there's real face to face rejection of the monster and releasing it and abandoning it. Right. Because that's the real asshole Victor. And then trying to pretend that he has no responsibility, which I actually thought the scene where he was almost relieved that the monster would die from plague was good because I'm like, yeah, that's the asshole I know. Um, <laughs> and uh, Can I oh, jump good. in with a, a thought yeah. that would actually, like, I think pull together a lot of our, of our ideas here? Absolutely. Um, what if instead of him just trying to create new life, what if he was specifically trying to resurrect Waldman? Um, and that the thing that disappoints him is that he doesn't see the shine of Waldman of Waldman's intellect. Like he he takes that mm-hmm. brain. We like that part. Like he takes the brain from his teacher that he respected and who like did this all. Like who died. So what if he was actually trying to revive the consciousness of his professor? Um, and that when the creature seems to be mute and and dumb. Uh, and and all of these things that like are not what he's trying to do here. He's like, it's a failure. I ha- I was trying to I was trying to cheat death, not create life here, but cheat death. And that's the same thing with his mother. And at the end of the movie with Elizabeth, so this creates a through line. Yeah, I like and that. Yeah, what we kind of jokingly stumbled into was like, well, what if Waldman played the recorder or like whatever musical instrument you want to do? And so that when the creature reappears, and it's not that he is Waldman, but that he is remembering like he I, I love De Niro's delivery of like explaining of how he like has words and knows how to do things or it's not things learned but like things like hazily remembered like that I thought was God, a that great seems detail. so well written yeah, yeah like that was great stuff so what if this is Waldman's detail like when like he a- encounters Frankenstein and Frank or like Frankenstein hears the recorder being played and that's how he like comes upon the monster and it's like all of it like so it turns out that it was a success that like it was his his impatience um, in the moment that 
caused him to dismiss this thing as like as just a, a an abomination or um, as as a failed experiment, and that's why the yeah. creature was rejected and sent out into the world. Um, but this gives the through line where we become very hard on the line of it. It's about cheating death and that that's what creates the monster in the first place. And that creates all this death. Um, so See, that, I, yeah. Yeah. I like all of that because that leads really beautifully into the latter part of the movie that I actually liked, you know? And so I think like I would keep the end. <laughs> I I would, I would let them start at the Arctic, but I would, scrap the the whole all the words like people will understand <laughs> that we that we're into science like from the first 46 minutes which will be cut down <laughs> um in my version and we'll be like we'll focus mostly on the science you'll still have like elizabeth and him falling in love you'll still have his mom you'll still have like the obsession of his family with science but i i want to see like the relationship the complicated relationship between father and son, father and sons, which could be a different, another theme, right? Because, uh, Oh, that's interesting. Frankenstein's father is very, uh, Victor's father is very proud of him as he sends him off to school. And he's very proud of his scientific, um, discoveries and proud of his brilliant son. And then Victor creates this monster and he's not proud of him. He doesn't even give him a name. And he's rejecting him. And then you, I would like uh, to piggyback a maze thing and have a scene where the father meets his son's monster and realizes the monster that he actually birthed. So it's like a lovely like father-son thing going on and ultimately dies at his son's, you know, monster's hand. And kind of at the end you know, this pyre for a father from the creature that he never loved. I mean, that's like a whole other through line. Like, yes, he was trying to cheat death and that's beautiful. But there's also this aspect of like, w- like what what is pride and what is disappointment and what is fathers and sons and what is, you know, birth and that kind of thing. So I don't know. I, I, w- I would want to kind of make that a secondary, less strong through line, but I would want it to be there. Cause I think that that's like, there is a lot of points, you know, like the father makes a point in front of all of these people to talk about how proud he is of Victor. Um, and so I think then, then you have that moment where he meets. No, no, I, the that's genius. Yeah. I love that. And it's actually like a thing that doesn't always, get um translated into into film adaptations uh because victor's father is really only like prominent in the book so if you're gonna adapt the book you 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 might but like you know you you usually victor's usually in his 30s or like the dr frankenstein is usually in his 30s and there's not really a mention of family but if you yeah if you're gonna do mary shelley's frankenstein and have the opportunity to feature victor's family why wouldn't you make the parallel of here's this loving, beautiful family who, you know, gave everything they could to this to, to make sure their son had the best opportunities. Something went awry. He becomes this cruel monster who makes a human being either out of grief or out of hubris and botches it. And then they all have to pay for it. Like, there's something actually mm-hmm. super fascinating about, like, God, where does it go wrong? Like, you could go either way with, like, Victor was always kind of a psychopath. That's one way that you could go. Or you could go into, like, you know, while it looks like this family is super functional, there are, there are gaps. Like, maybe they're, you know, they have the material wealth, but there actually isn't really any love there. So when it I... comes time for Victor to love something he made, he, he like, he literally can't do it. Yeah, I mean, I think you could even, like, expand a little bit on that. So in that 46 (laughs) wasted minutes, (laughs) um, I'm sorry, I'm still mad about it. I feel like you could add something about younger Victor that is, like, a little bit odd where, like, with a dissection moment where his dad kind of is just like, huh, hmm, there's, like, a little bit of... Yeah, that's Victor a little killed weird a squirrel and is, is but, dissecting it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but like, and then, but like, his parents could be like, oh, well, he's just curious. He's just like, you know, and like the kind of things that like doting parents will kind of like look over, kind of that like. I mean, we we know. Legit, I think I think Ted Bundy did either Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer did do stuff like that, like where yeah, 
he he like did uh, uh, dissect animals and the family was like, OK, you're into science. That's great. Yeah. So I, I think that there could be something like that because it also goes along with his fascination about just like how like body like kind of the body works. And it also will give you the sense. I think it actually makes the movie a little creepier, which I like even though I'm really not into scary things, which anyone who's listened to previous podcasts know. Um, but, yeah. No, I, th- I think that that would actually be, like, kind of, you know, it could be, like, just his dad witnesses it. You know, his mom doesn't pass it off, but his dad's like, oh, he's just he's just curious, you know? Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. I mean, I think we have a great Frankenstein movie, guys. I think. Yeah. No, honestly, legit. Like, I am not. I'm not gonna forget this. <laughs> we we fixed it. Let's 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 get a a budget for it. Let's. Fi- <laughs> yeah. So we want we what? so we want it to have like better mood lighting. We want it to be younger and sexier, but we also want him to be creepier. Uh, and we want to have like the the sort of like parent kind of vibe going on with mm-hmm, everything, mm-hmm. which I think also works yeah. with the Waldman stuff because he's like a father figure at school. Uh, yeah. And then like so, a father figure becomes his child. And his actual father is dismissive of him because I, I like that. Like if he's experimenting as a kid, if he's goes too far when trying to resurrect the mom or, stop, or save her during childbirth, like I think those are all good vibes there. I really like this. I really yeah, like this. Damn, idea. we did it. We fixed it. You're welcome. You're welcome, Kenneth Brenner. <laughs> <laughs> You're still fired. I, uh... I, I interned at Marvel Studios in 2010. This is before Disney bought them. And Kenneth Branagh Did was Thor, around. Yeah, because yeah, he was, they were doing posts on Thor. So occasionally I would have to deliver mail from like the main building we were all in to where the Thor people were. And like his mail would say Ken on it. And I'd be like, whoa, that's Kenneth Branagh. Here I go. And I got to say, we've been hard on him. I think he is a talented actor when someone else is directing him. And I think he can actually be a very good director. I like all the Asgard stuff in Thor. I, I mean, I like Thor 1 just in general. But, like, I like the Asgard stuff is, like, big and exactly his jam and looks fine. <laughs> yeah. No, he's a talented individual. It's just, like, in this instance, everything was wrong. You made every bad decision. Pro- maybe, not probably, but maybe because you were perhaps distracted by someone else on set and you had other things going on, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he just really wanted to look in the eyes of his actual lover and be like, you are my sister. <laughs> <laughs> and I need everyone to know how ripped I am. I really, I really need people to know this about me. Mm-hmm. Listen, he worked very hard on that body and there was like... But that was like, but, but what, not that on was the like script. Ten minutes. That was, <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. This is the it was hubris. Like ten minutes, right? It was like ten minutes of like him creating the monster with his shirt off, and I was just like, mm-hmm. this. This feels like a lot of scenes. And then I was like, maybe it's really hot in the bar. Like I was like making excuses for it. <laughs> It sucks, like, not to just be a Frankenstein nerd and get, like, really lost in the weeds, but, like, my favorite part of the book is how the as the monster nears completion, he's getting sicker because he's just so obsessed. He's, like, he starts, like, ignoring how to take care of himself. So he is, like, actually getting sicker and sicker and becoming very sickly, like, by the end of it. And to just see Kenneth Branagh, like, spit in my eye and be like, no, <laughs> we will have none of that here. Never. And I'm like, but it's poetic. And he's like, I don't care. I'm doing calisthenics I, I will have in frost, the corner. I will have frostbite in the in the Arctic scenes, but it'll be sexy frostbite at the oh good my spots. God, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> again, I, I, I th- this is his one qualifying mark for playing Victor Frankenstein. It's yeah, it's ego. It, in a weird way, it this is a very interestingly meta, a successful meta ad- adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in that a man with a lot of hubris came in and made something that kind of looks like a movie, but uh, it's not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm going to also pitch something else. I think this would have been better as a musical. Put some numbers in it. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, again, like just, they just vamp into scenes it. Almost everything is staged like it, like the boat scene at the beginning, the resurrection scene, like the frolicking stuff. It all feels like some big, I mean, like we, like an opera or like some big Broadway musical. Like yeah, almost ha- every have, scene feels like it's about to be a, a song. 
have the crew yeah, sing absolutely. about mutiny, have a love song about loving your sister. Um, I have have a kind of like Mr. Cellophane esque song for the monster. Um, just like go all out with it, like just. Just do it. Do do a fun reanimation song like you have in like Grease Two with reproduction. Like oh, seriously, you guys. Like... There's a, there's actually like a Frankenstein <laughs> musical that's decent. Oh yeah. Wait, you know what? No, hang on, hang on. It's not decent, but the song, uh, the resurrection song, is actually like it slaps pretty hard. <laughs> I'm, I'm now just imagining doing a fan video of just like putting that music on top of Mary Shelley's <laughs> Frankenstein and having having a field day. Mm. It's probably going to work great because I really I I think like that's the other way. I mean like just just do it or you know keep Kenneth as Victor because ego ego works and get a different director. Have and someone recast write him the in. younger scenes. And recast the younger scenes, yes. Yeah. Like, like at least, at least, like, that scene where his mom comes to talk to him. Because I was, like, I was, like, damn, like, I know, like, reproductive, like, like, like science, like, you know, like, how long women are fertile is definitely off and not correct. But I was, like, but damn, like, she looks pretty good. And she's, like, really pregnant. And he's, like, what, 30 now? Right. <laughs> and I was, like, good for her. Like, this is, you know, and then, um, and then I realized, no, wait, he's supposed to be younger. Yeah, he's supposed to be fifteen in that scene. No, no. Yeah, then, there's a, then there's like a three years later bit, and that's when he's going off to school. Oh, oh yeah. No. The, yep. Like oh. they should have just had like, a, like it's one scene. You can have, you can have. It's like barely even like. Well, and they five, had a child actor minutes. in the scene before because, like, Branna as. Uh, like as conceited as he is, understood that he couldn't play a five-year-old. What if he tried? What if, I know. What if <laughs> uncut like, what if it was his head on a child's body, like one of those <laughs> like superimposed kind of things? <laughs> the studio was just like, Ken, you can't. You gotta. You gotta change this. And he's like, Are you sure? <laughs> you know Mystified by my acting. Like, Let me sure. explain to you the concept of acting. <laughs> I take on a role and I transform into the part. <laughs> I can play a very convincing tree. It works. Um, yeah, I I think you know those are all viable ways that this works. I mean, ultimately, just like let, just someone grab Guillermo del Toro, sit yes. him down, yeah. and be like, "Listen, Guillermo, I understand. I understand. You have like a million things you want to do, and making a movie is fucking hard, dude. I get it. But, dude." Can you take one for the team and just focus on this one? (laughs) Can you please just make this one for us? We have a very decent pitch. We just laid it out for you. Actually, honestly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, because, like, if they cut to him in school as, like, a senior or some, or just an older, like, an upperclassman as Kenneth Branagh, would have been way less of an issue. So, like, just keep all the younger stuff for, like, a different actor. And it wouldn't be nearly as jarring. And then he can still devour all the scenery he wants. Yeah. Oh, and he will. He will. Oh, yes. Because he's Victor Frankenstein. Cue the lightning. Matt, can you can you place lightning in there? The sound of thunder. Thanks. I have to tell you guys, I was watching this movie with my fiance, and she laughed so hard at the title for when Mary Shelley's Frankenstein came up that like every time there was like a beat. That could have worked for the title. She just yelled, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, really loud <laughs> for the entire two hour picture. Oh, this movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So every time there's a movie that we have to buy or rent uh, for one of these, uh, you know, when it's just not available on, on free streaming or like not free, but streaming that we're already paying for, um, there's always that debate of like, well, do we spend like the extra like you know five to nine dollars to like buy it? Um, and for this one, we were like, eh, we'll rent it. And at the end of it, we were both like, I'm glad that we rented that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no one, no one needs this movie. No, no one does. I'm usually, I'm usually a weirdo about movies. Like, I, I will, I'll love a movie for one good scene. 
Or I'll love a movie for one good, like, moment with an actor I particularly like. It could be just, like, the world's worst movie, but I'll love it for that one little nugget. And this is just one of those where you can, it, it, ha- it basically doesn't have that. Like, maybe The Bride, maybe, I don't know. Eh. I, I would definitely watch the, the end again. I would definitely watch that last scene with Gennaro uh, and the pyre and, like, you know, that you know, mourning his father who never really loved him because um, he was an asshole. Um, and I I would enjoy, like, I would watch that again because I, I, I really enjoyed that. Like, I actually think I, like, clapped a little bit because um, I was like, yeah, that's that's a good end. Um, but other than that, um, no, I would never watch this movie again. <laughs> Not in the, the state that it was theatrically. Maybe maybe once we get our hands on it, you know, watch and that fix movie. fix it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I actually really like this. I, I feel really good about it. And it, it helps that we have like a, 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 a classic novel to, <laughs> to sort of be a reference point. And then even taking the choices they made to streamline it, like they're, they're, all of those are actually good ideas that we can kind of go with. Like Elizabeth stuff, great. Like the Waldman stuff, great. Like, yeah, let's bu- build on those things. Um, it's just like it's so clearly the wrong ego got involved in this movie. And mm-hmm. it's it's a bummer. Anyway, I feel like we, we've said our piece about this. May, give your plugs. Uh, cool. Hello. Uh, my name is May Cat. Um, I have Transformers War for Cybertron Kingdom coming out, as I said, in t- uh, July 2021. I really enjoyed it. I hope you all enjoy it if you're a Transformers fan. Gosh, what else? I have a bunch of other things that I legally can't like disclose yet, just like projects on the side that I've worked on. I do have a podcast myself. However, we are taking a break because we're screenwriters and we all got very, very, very busy. But if you want to check it out, it's called The Weird Sisters Podcast. And you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I'm trying TikTok. I'm trying to get good at TikTok. It's hard. I'm 30. But I'm on all the social medias as at Maycat, M-A-E-C-A-T-T. And yes, that is my real name. How's that for a plug? <laughs> it was I'm really me, I swear. Uh uh, occasionally I'll see someone online who's just like, oh, that's a really good stage name. I'm like, ah, oh, no, it's it's on the birth certificate. That's it. It's on everything. That's It's legal. <laughs> look at my license. Wait, don't look at my license. Just trust me. That's my name. <laughs> yeah, everyone should be checking all that that out. Well, I mean, we'll put links in the description uh, for this. And uh, speaking oh, as a Transformers fan, I'm excited. Yeah, oh, shucks. Ch- check, all that, check all that stuff out. It, it, it'll be great. Sam, where can people find you? Nowhere. Here. <laughs> Here. <laughs> I'm a concept. Yeah, I, I'm actually a figment of Case's imagination. Um, so <gasps> if you want to praise the show or if you have any complaints, especially if you have complaints, you can find Case at... Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Case Aiken. You can find the show on Twitter at Another Pass. You can find stuff that we're working on at CertainPOV.com. We've got tons of great shows. We, we referenced it earlier, but May has been on a few things. But I'm going to shout out Screen Snark right now, which is a really fun discussion or like media discussion show that Matt Storm and Rachel Quirky Shank uh, host. Host and bring in a guest each week. They talk about the the latest things that are on their minds and and then sort of just go into getting to know their guests and like having a really like inviting space to to socialize and get to know each other. It's a great show. Go check that out. Also at certainpov.com you can find a link to our Discord server. We are currently having the call on Discord, but like come on come come on to our server. We 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 talk, we we share memes, we talk about spoilers for Marvel TV shows right now. When this drops the Falcon and the Winter Soldier will have ended a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not sure where we're going to be on 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 that phase, but uh we have a really active discussion for any sort of like thing that's in the zeitgeist. Um it's a really good time. Come come check that all out. Yeah, Sam, take us home. Next time on this show, we'll be talking about Highlander 2: The Quickening. But until then, if you enjoyed it, pass it on. Thanks for listening to Certain Point of View's Another Pass podcast. Don't miss an episode. Just subscribe and review the show on iTunes. Just go to certainpov.com.
Yeah, if only Amazing. we could create a human that was stronger. <laughs> that's, not even, that's not even the intent. It's just cheat death. Well, that's that's the idea. Like the the motivation is so muddled because they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. This movie is just a constant battle of trying to have your cake and eat it too. Ab- absolutely. Uh, Stronger, yeah. more resilient, and amazing. Like he was really going for the strength in this one. He was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a superhuman." <laughs> yeah, are you gonna make a superhuman or are you gonna stave off death? Which is it? Because yeah. those are like, I, you guys are gonna learn. I'm a huge Frankenstein fan, so I watch this and I'm just like, "Oh, you're, you're just trying to marry what you love about the book and marry what you love about pop culture's understanding of Frankenstein and smoosh it into one thing, <laughs> even though they're not the same thing." Yeah. Oh, wait, were you on Screen Snark bringing the the Benedict Cumberbatch version? Hell yeah! yeah oh my I god, I mean, I totally forgot about that. I'm just on a Frankenstein roll with this. <laughs> <laughs> on podcasts, I only talk about Transformers or Frankenstein, apparently. Well, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those are pretty good properties, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. I'm not complaining, it's just an observation. I, ha- I just did it with myself. <laughs> And remember that intelligence is knowing that Frankenstein is the doctor. Wisdom is knowing that Frankenstein is the monster. Nerd. <gasps> <laughs> Next time on Another Pass, we're going to do Highlander the Quickening 2. And I Ooh, forgot give, the rest give, of give those words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find where I wrote it down, Case. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember my line. We haven't done this in a couple of weeks. And I'm searching the chat and I cannot find it. Matt, no, laugh at me. Or do laugh at me. This is ridiculous. What do I say again? <laughs> Next time on this show, we will be talking about Highlander 2, The Quickening. But until then, if you enjoyed the show, pass it on. Next time on this show, we'll be talking about Highlander, The Quickening. 2, okay. Highlander 2. <laughs> <laughs> you got this, you got this. I'm too busy laughing at myself. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.